Good evening. My name is Shelby Friedel, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Dickinson School of Law, Penn State University, Student Senate, and the Churchill Fund, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Blindfolds Off, How Judges Decide. Judges have exceptionally important jobs. Not only do they interpret the laws of our nation, their decisions influence multiple aspects of American life. Most Americans do not know much about how judges decide cases. They have limited knowledge on what factors influence a judge's decision or how they go about making a decision. Our speaker tonight, Judge John E. Jones III, will discuss the nature of judging and the role judges play in American political, social, cultural, and economic life. Appointed by President George W. Bush, Jones has been serving as a district judge for the Middle District of Pennsylvania for 12 years. He is the 21st U.S. District Judge to sit on the Middle District of Pennsylvania. While serving as a district judge, Jones has presided over several well-known cases. His most recent notable case was Whitewood v. Wolf, where he ruled Pennsylvania's ban on same-sex marriage unconstitutional. In 2005, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania appointed Jones to the Pennsylvania Commission on Judicial Independence. Chief Justice John Roberts appointed him to the Committee on Judicial Security, a standing committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. In 2006, Judge Jones received the Outstanding Alumni Award from Dickinson School of Law University, as well as an honorary doctorate in law and public policy from Dickinson College where he is recognized as one of the 25 most influential graduates of the college's over 220 year history. In 2009, Judge Jones was the recipient of the Geological Society of America's 2009 President's Medal, and in the same year, he was inducted into the George Washington Spirit Society. Judge Jones is a member of the Board of Trustees of Dickinson College. He also serves as a member of the Board of Regents of the Mercersburg Academy, and the Board of Counselors of the Dickinson School of Law of the Penn State University, where he serves as an adjunct professor. To facilitate the discussion with Judge Jones, we have with us Harry Pullman, Executive Director of the Clark Forum and Professor of Political Science, and Gary Gilden, Interim Dean and Professor of Law at Penn State Dickinson School of Law. At this time, I would like to ask that you please silence all cell phones and other electronic devices. If you would like to participate, in a live tweeting of the event, we are using the hashtags Clark Forum and How Judges Decide. A question and answer session will follow the lecture, so please hold your questions until then. Now please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, John Judge E. Jones III. Thank you, Shelby, for, those, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, every member of the audience for coming out on this gloomy and dark night to join us in this, in this discussion uh, about the nature of, of judging and the role that judges play in our constitutional system. Um, I'd like to begin with the obvious, and by that I mean uh, begin with a question about uh, the legal uh, transition that we find ourselves in, uh, and that I'm referring to, of course, is the legalization of equal mar marriage, also known as uh, same-sex marriage. And I begin here because, Judge, of course, you, um, you've had a part in this transition. Uh, how do you, as a judge, uh, understand the significance of this transition and the speed with which it has occurred? Well, as a, as a citizen, um, Harry, I, I don't think in my time um, I've ever seen uh, uh, public opinion move so rapidly uh, on, on an issue. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, breathtaking. Um, and, and by that I mean obviously the, the public opinion has shifted rapidly in favor of um, uh, same-sex marriage and, and against uh, bans on same-sex marriage. Uh, but you know, the important thing from a judging standpoint uh, to, to say, as I, as I cite that, uh, is that, um, uh, and, and I think this is lost a lot of times on the public, is that we don't rule according to public opinion. 
So uh, the, the decisions that we make, and I was the 13th judge, federal judge, to, to strike down bans in states, um, those decisions are not predicated on a, a, a wave of, of uh, public opinion. Now, sometimes it happens that um, these cases move alongside of uh, public opinion. Sometimes they get ahead of public opinion, and I guess sometimes they're behind public opinion, but it's, it's, um, the, the decisions are based on the law uh, uh, because the, the third branch is not uh, designed to be the, a majoritarian uh, branch, but, but on the other hand is, is uh, uh, as is frequently said, is, is designed to, to provide um, a bulwark against the tyranny of the majority. So, so um, there's an interesting contrast there, but as a, as a, as a policy issue, um, uh, it's remarkable uh, with the, 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 the lightning-like speed that, uh, that this has moved just over the last couple of years. When you consider that, um, for example, the Pennsylvania DOMA that I struck down uh, was signed into law by Governor Tom Ridge. Uh, the federal DOMA that was struck down in, in large measure by uh, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, in 2013 in the Windsor case, uh, the federal DOMA was, was signed into law by Bill Clinton. Um, uh, the, the, Bill Clinton and Tom Ridge uh, both signed amicus briefs uh, in favor of Windsor, the plaintiff, uh, in the Windsor case. So they had done a 180 in terms of their... Um, their views uh, on this uh, on this subject, which I think is emblematic of, of what I just said about uh, public opinion. Let me press you on that, if I could, a little bit, uh, in terms of the mode of the transition and the legitimacy of the mode of getting ourselves there. So, your opinion itself cited the fact that the limits on same-sex marriage were passed overwhelmingly at the legislature. I think you cited 117 mm -hmm. to 16 in the mm -hmm. House. 43 to 5 in the Senate, mm -hmm. so these were uber super majorities that affirmed the ban. And you also pointed out that there was never a moment in which the Pennsylvania legislature passed any sort of protection against discrimination based upon sexual preference. So you find yourself now an unelected federal judge, not accountable to any member of the Pennsylvania society. And how do you factor that into your decision or your role as a federal judge to override that overwhelming majority consensus in, in Pennsylvania, at least as expressed legislatively? Yeah, and it's, it, it, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very good question, Gary, and it's, it's something that's oft used as a criticism of what federal judges do. Um, and and I, I guess, uh, you know, if you drill into that, it is that uh, uh, the, the, the larger the majority, uh, when, a, when a, there's a legislative enactment, uh, the more uh, it avoids judicial review. Well, of course, that's not the way the system works. And um, I am unelected, but uh, again, lost to the public. Uh, and I think a teachable moment in all of these cases is that we're a co-equal branch of government. We are fulfilling a role that was envisioned by the framers, or at least some of them. Um, Judicial review has been around since Marbury versus Madison in, in uh, 1803. Uh, it, it so happens uh, in the annals of history that uh, uh, the, the, the legislation that was passed uh, overwhelmingly uh, ends up being uh, struck down. It isn't as if we don't mean to be deferential uh, and understand our place in the world, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, a legislative enactment uh, that violates the Constitution of the United States, and that, as you know, is, is what we are um, uh, responsive uh, to, uh, the Constitution, and not necessarily the will of the, of the majority of the legislature. If it doesn't, you know, if, if a Pennsylvania law uh, violates the United States Constitution, then that Pennsylvania law uh, simply falls, regardless of what the majority was. But I'm acutely aware, because of the criticisms that judges received, myself obviously included, um, that that is a difficult concept for the, for the public to, to grasp. And, and I understand why uh, that's difficult. Also lost, I think, is a very fundamental thing about judges and their place sort of in government as a, as a co-equal branch, as I said, because we, we are a product of this sort of checks and balance system. Um, we didn't appear fully formed. Uh, Judge, federal judges, as, as I know you know, obviously, uh, are, are appointed by the President of the United States, so the 
the, uh, the second branch is involved. The first branch is involved in the sense that the Senate uh, has to vote to confirm us. Um, and, and so, there, and, and we are also, as you know, uh, are subject to appellate review, our, our determinations. So there are implicit and built into the system checks on, on what we do. So um, I, I take uh, issue, uh, and I do hear it, and I know you meant the question to be provocative, and it's a good question, but, but the unaccountable part uh, is, 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 is really not correct. Uh, it, it, unelected, yes, uh, but, but I think that um, uh, misstates the case if, if it, if it uh, leads to a determination or a, or a thought that we're not responsive because we or responsible because we are. Well, let me take um, another slant on Gary's question. Uh, if my information is correct, in 2010, 29 states constitutionally prohibited uh, equal marriage, mm -hmm. while uh, 11 states um, uh, prohibited, prohibited by statute. So you're talking about 41 states. Today, 35, 35 states recognize the legality of same-sex marriage. Now, in that process, only, as I understand it, about 11 states have uh, ratified same-sex marriage mm -hmm. through popular vote referendum yes. of those types. So it's pretty clear that the federal judiciary is leading the charge. What gives the federal courts the legitimacy to uh, produce such, what you have called significant, remarkable, Legal well, transition. Well, I'll tell you what uh, gives the, the legitimacy and, and the wellspring uh, for these decisions, and it's a very interesting sort of factoid, uh, is the Windsor case uh, in 2013 that, uh, that uh, struck down, um, uh, significantly struck down uh, DOMA. Now, that case didn't declare marriage to be uh, uh, such a fundamental right uh, uh, that uh, it declared a, a national right to same-sex marriage. The, the, the opinion obviously stopped short of that. And, uh, you know, the facts of that case are inside baseball, but it basically said uh, if a state recognizes a same-sex marriage, then the government can't, tr the federal, the federal government, government. Can't, can't, can't trump that, right. uh, uh, you know, to, to give the quick executive summary. And, and the analysis by Justice Kennedy uh, in that case was really somewhat mixed, and he, he probably purposefully, I think, didn't say um, exactly what he was doing uh, in the decision, whether it was equal protection or whether it was due process, uh, although it sure looked like equal protection to me and to many observers that he was doing an equal protection uh, analysis. Justice Scalia, in his dissent, uh, said, make no mistake about what we're doing uh, in this case. We are, in Scalia's view, uh, opening a Pandora's box uh, because we have now paved the way uh, by stopping just short of, of uh, declaring a national right to same-sex marriage to, to challenges that will spring up all across the country. He was precisely correct, and in fact, I said that, in my opinion, in, in uh, uh, Whitewood versus Wolf. So the wellspring for all of these cases was, was the Windsor case. I don't, I don't think any federal district court uh, would have led this parade uh, of cases without the, 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 the sort of undergirding of the, of the uh, Windsor case in, in 2013. But following the rationale, uh, my view, and I'm obviously a number of my colleagues, because many then came after my decision, which as I said was the 13th, the, 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 um, the, the inescapable, uh, I, I think, uh, import uh, and, and logical um, follow through from the, the uh, Windsor case was, was, is in the cases that, including mine, uh, that were decided that it was, in fact, an equal protection analysis. I don't think the court uh, had the votes. Uh, I don't think Kennedy had um, uh, the consensus at that time on the court. Uh, to do perhaps what he might have wanted to do. I can't read his mind, uh, but um, Scalia predicted that uh, in not a great amount of time it would be back before them um, testing whether there is in fact uh, that national right. And it appears that 
uh, with the circuit split now, it's going to be back on the court's docket in the, in the very near future. I would suspect either at the end of this term, the 2014-2015 term, or early in the 2015-2016 in the term. So let me seize on two threads that have merged uh, in a discontinuous way. You uh, mentioned Justice Scalia, so that's part of the thing I'm going to draw from. And uh, in response to the first discussion, you identified that judges, uh, federal judges have a special anti-majoritarian role when they're enforcing constitutional rights. That is, they were designed to limit majorities. But of course, whether the legitimacy of a judge in exercising that role often depends upon his or her theory of constitutional interpretation. So as you well know, uh, Justice Scalia is the proponent of the notion that it, so that judges don't become policy makers putting their own value systems out there, that they ought to be dealing with the original intent of the framers. That is, we'd have to find the, the right in the language of the Constitution or the intent of the framers. And in your opinion, you were dealing with a very broad clause, due process, and actually in its mm -hmm. most fuzzy form as a source of substantive rights. And in your reasoning, you, you rejected the notion that you would have to find this right to be deeply rooted in the nation's history in order for it to be protected by substantive due process. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, if we reject the original intent approach, uh, what, are the, what is the principled and way in which you as a judge could give meaning to very broad terms of a 200-year-old-plus charter in the way that's the most anti-majoritarian way? Well, it, it's, it's hard. And uh, you, you know, what, what, what uh, Dean Gilden is talking about is uh, there's these marvelous uh, uh, debates, uh, and you may have seen them on C-SPAN, uh, between Justice Breyer and, and Justice Scalia. And, and uh, it, Justice Breyer is the proponent of the living uh, Constitution, of course, and Justice Scalia is the proponent of the dead Constitution, uh, which sounds a little stark, uh, but, but it goes to the, to the originalism that, that uh, for those who are not law students or budding uh, law students or lawyers or judges, there are a number of judges in the room, and, and it's an interesting dichotomy. But here's the problem, and, and I'm going to answer the question this way. Um, it is wonderful in theory um, uh, to talk about uh, originalism, and it's wonderful in theory to talk about um, uh, not uh, deciding anything unless you can find the rationale somewhere in, in the, in the, expressly in the Constitution. But, but, you know, in practice, that's very hard. Um, and I think uh, that it, that it um, defies reality. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we have found things uh, uh, sort of hiding in plain sight uh, through the history of this country. Um, you know, we had a case that we're all well aware of, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, um, which, which struck down, obviously, separate but equal. Um, you know, we, we, we have, through history, uh, uh, had judicial determinations that, that um, a, a appear to, uh, to extrapolate widely uh, from the, the text of the Constitution of the United States. There's a very interesting case, the Jones case, that was decided a couple years ago by the Supreme Court. Fascinating case for lawyers and judges. And the case involved uh, a GPS device that was placed under the wheel well of a car to track a car. Uh, and and the, the uh, idea was uh, that the, the defendant challenged the, the attachment of this GPS device, saying that uh, it, it violated his Fourth Amendment right to be free from uh, uh, an unlawful search and seizure. All right. So, so the case got all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court decided in an opinion written by Scalia uh, that, that it was, and Scalia is pretty strict about these things, um, he decided that it, that it was an unlawful search. And he said this is, a, in, in his inimitable way, he said this is a, this is a no brainer. Uh, this is a very easy case to decide uh, because without a warrant, the officer had placed his hand in the wheel well of the car, in, invaded uh, the, the, the property uh, uh, of, the, of the defendant, and, and placed the GPS, game, set, match, should have had a warrant, intruded, uh, sort of broke into the curtilage, uh, 
and therefore it was, it was a, an unlawful search. Done, right? Now, uh, Justice Scalia, you know, no flaming liberal, obviously, or, or, or Ju Justice Alito, pardon me, no, no flaming uh, liberal he, you know, obviously in the court, wrote and said, this is not as easy as you think. Um, he concurred. He felt that the search was unlawful as well. But he said to simply take this on the basis uh, that, it, that it, based on the text, and again, Scalia was going right from the text of the Fourth Amendment, that, that you have to invade it, um, absolutely flies in the face of reality today. And, and he said, suppose this were an issue with a cell phone where somebody's tracking somebody based on the GPS uh, device in their, in their cell phone. Nobody's intruding. Um, do you need a warrant for that? There, you know, it's, 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 it's certainly an invasion. Uh, it certainly looks like it might violate the Fourth Amendment. And, and of course, his point is that, you know, there are times that technology has run so far afield of anything that the framers could have envisioned that you cannot find a strict basis in the Fourth Amendment to make this decision. So it's a very interesting guy who would claim, I guess, Justice Alito, uh, to be uh, an originalist in his thought. And he was sort of searching at that point and agonizing over some of these cases involving technology. That case now uh, went back in front of the Supreme Court about cell phones, uh, just as he thought uh, that it would. And um, it, it points out, it, it, it's a long narrative, but it, but it points out the problem uh, with that type of analysis. So, in effect, in the Windsor, or in the Whitewood case, I, I mean, I said, this, this right may have been hiding in plain sight, um, but, you know, it, 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 uh, it's there, uh, and, and, uh, and I didn't have a problem fleshing that out in the, co in the uh, context of what I had to do in the opinion. So if I could follow just for one second, because you know people who write about judges who are writing opinions assume that they are agonizing and mulling over their theory of constitutional interpretation. So do you think in your consciousness, you know, your theory of the living constitution enters your mind that I've got to make sure I have a principled way to interpret constitutions, or are you just taking the facts and the law as presented in this case? And trial, trial judges, Gary, and you know a lot of them, are, are very practical people. Um, and, and I don't think in 12 and a half years I've ever sat in my chambers and said, all right, Jones, are you, are you an originalist, uh, or, or is this a living document? And looked out the window, the beautiful view out of my chambers, and agonized you know, over exactly what I am. I'm a practical guy. Um, and, I, and I decide cases on that, on that basis. I, I do, I did understand, um, as I always do when I decide a case, and particularly a, a case that, that lends itself to controversy like this, that, um, uh, that I would be exposed to, to, to criticisms. And when you, when you are joining your colleagues, as I was, as I said, the 13th, in sort of blazing new territory, um, it, it's, it's always, uh, it's always going to sub subject you to, um, you know, to, to criticism. That's fair game. But the, but the, fa but the fact of the matter is, um, I, I think it's a very logical analysis uh, to, to make under equal protection and under, under due process. At the end of the day, taking due process, and, and again, I don't want to get wonky or, or, or too in the weeds here, but at the end of the day, um, there, there was simply Pennsylvania, in the case of my case, could not, was unable to, uh, to, to establish any rational basis f for that law. None. None whatsoever. Uh, other than sort of hyperbolic representations, which really drove the enactment of the, of the law in the, in, the, uh, in the first instance. They, they, they simply they simply fell away. And if you wanted, you know, one of the interesting things was Judge Posner in the circuit court, um, uh, who um, is not a particularly charming guy to go in front of when you're doing an oral argument, who eviscerated the lawyers who were in front of him. I, I listened to the oral argument, uh, and Posner ended up writing the opinion uh, for his circuit that, uh, that um, struck, affirmed the lower court decisions and, and struck down the bans. And he absolutely eviscerated the lawyers who tried mightily, um, but could not come up with one example 
of their states having a rational basis for these, uh, for these enactments. Um, so, I wonder well, whether, would it satisfy this rational basis, which just means a legitimate governmental purpose, that from an Edmund Burkean point of view, people could just argue, this is what we mean by marriage, this is what we've had for centuries, uh, wouldn't that be enough? To no, well, sure, and, and, and um, uh, you know, I, I, I go back to Brown versus Board of Education, so you say, well, this is what we mean, we mean separate but equal, you know, look at everybody's being treated fairly, I mean, uh, they just don't happen to be together, you know, I mean, it, 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 that's the... But no that, one really believed that. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but you, you, you make this kind of, uh, you know, you turn it on its head and you say, uh, well, if we say it's fair, then it's fair, you know, uh, and, and that... And that doesn't pass constitutional muster. And that's kind of what Pennsylvania said. I mean, that was all they had. And they were out of ammo, you know, after that, which is, which is that um, uh, this, this is deeply ingrained in our tradition, and, and that's why we passed it. Well, it, it, you know, it, 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 when you're dealing with the rights of individuals, my view, and, I, and I'm not alone, uh, obviously, then I, I, I don't think that argument holds water. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can rest on that. That doesn't fulfill a rational basis uh, analysis. You know, was there some harm that they're seeking to avoid? What, what, would, what was the harm? Well, they couldn't say that. Uh, did it promote something? Uh, did it, did, you know, um, did, did same-sex marriage promote uh, procreation? Plenty of, of, uh, of uh, heterosexual, or, or does heterosexual marriage promote uh, procreation? Pl plenty, of, plenty of heterosexuals in marriage choose not to have children. You know, you can go through the litany of uh, examples that are given and, and they don't work. Uh, and so it, it, it really, at the end of the day, was sort of a canard to say that there's a real rational basis other than, um, I think, a moral objection to, uh, to same-sex marriage. That's really, when you stripped it all away, that's all they had at the end of the day. In fact, Harry, it, it was remarkable to me that there was so little submitted by, in the briefs uh, by Pennsylvania, and I give them points for candor because I don't think they had a lot uh, in terms of, of uh, citing a rational basis, and I think that happened in state after state. Well, could I re return to your um, comments about Justice Scalia's approach and the drawbacks, the difficulties, the problems with original intent, and your comments about the uh, GPS case and the evolving, mm -hmm. and, and uh, your seeming endorsement of a, a view of the Constitution as a living Constitution. You said uh, that. You said that. No, I mean, I, well, if it's, I, not, if it's not that, what is it? Well, uh, ICB, you know, I, and, and I'm not trying to be facetious. I, I'm saying to you that, that uh, that's a wonderful academic argument. And I love watching uh, uh, Justices Scalia and, and, and Breyer argue about that. And bless them, you know, for having the ability to get up on stage and do that. And it's highly entertaining. But the fact of the matter is, for those of us who are trial judges, you know, toiling sort of uh, at this level, and that goes to the question that, uh, that uh, the dean asked, you know, I, I'm not sure that we're tethered to those concepts. Maybe, maybe we're a little bit pick and choose, you know, on these things. But um, to express our judicial philosophy in those pigeonholes would, would I, I'm, I'm resistant to that because, because uh, I may be trying to find something in the text, uh, you know, in a particular case. I'm simply saying it's not necessarily a practical exercise uh, in every case. Would that it was. Uh, there's a durability to this Constitution, but it is not uh, perfect. Um, and and you, to, to decide cases consistently and well, you have to extrapolate. And, and if that extrapolation sometimes becomes so detached that you get accused of being a living constitutionalist, Look, you know, I plead guilty, but I, I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm going to resist describing myself as, as one or the other. Fair enough. I think most, most trial judges would. So can we move to the toiling part of the job, as you mentioned it, because I think there's some, you know, this, this is actually dear and dear to my heart. So you said, I'm just a practical guy, we're doing logical analysis. In the audience are a couple of first-year law students who've just spent a whole semester learning that the way the legal systems work is that we are in a system of precedent. The judge's job is simply to say, here's a new fact situation. What do the previously decided cases tell me I must do? And it, the thesis is this is a purely objective, logical, non-judgmental exercise, the whole thesis of the system. Mm -hmm. 
So we go through your opinion and we, we see the malleability of the world of precedent. So you're faced with the United States Supreme Court case from 1972 that said there's not even a substantial federal question uh, in a challenge to a ban on same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, that was a 1972 decision. You know, a lot's changed since then. Then there was a 2014 Supreme Court order which stayed a district court decision in Utah which struck down a ban and the Commonwealth asked you to read into that a signal from the Supreme Court that we shouldn't be striking those down. And then when it come time to apply the equal protection analysis, you said, well, there's really no definitive word from the Third Circuit or United States Supreme Court. So let me take my best stab of a very, very comprehensive view of case law giving up to this. But you know, we've just spent a semester teaching our students how to argue in any case both sides. So I'm just curious as to what role you think precedent plays versus the practical, the facts strike me that this is the right thing to do. And you know, the way some people would put it, do judges really work from precedents first? Uh, or do they work from what they think the right thing is and that somehow consciously or subconsciously impacts the oh, view that, of their precedents? That's a great question. I, and and um, you know, the system fully uh, is based on precedent and I, would never contend to represent otherwise, and I and I would, I would never want to confuse or discourage any of our, any of our uh, law students who are present. Um, to 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 clarify, um, there there was a case uh, in 1972 that you cited, and uh, it, it was a case that the Supreme Court simply refused to take on the merits. They didn't decide it. Uh, and um, it was, it was uh, I guess, a case they could have taken at that time, uh, but it was uh, 40 years prior to my case. Um, you know, sometimes the tenor of the times drive judicial uh, decisions. And I don't mean by that that, they, that public opinion does, but simply whether courts are ready to tackle uh, particular issues. I've, you know, I've often said that, um, um, you know, Roe versus Wade couldn't have been decided 10 years before uh, it was. Brown, uh, previously cited Brown versus Board of Education, couldn't have been decided in 1944 the way it was decided in 1954. It involves courts not ta tackling issues, uh, you know, before their time. That case was of little use to me because, it, you know, the precedent that it, that it allegedly stood for um, was because the court chose not to wade into the controversy in 1972 that that was game, set, match. The more compelling precedent, or, or at least a guiding light, was the Windsor case in 2013, which for the first time, my view, and again, many of my colleagues, opened the door to, as, as again, Justice Scalia predicted, uh, full frontal challenges to these, to these laws. And, and if you read Windsor alongside that, 1972 case, uh, it, 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 it was clear uh, that although it didn't expressly overrule it, the, the direct implication from a precedential standpoint was that it, that it, it, it destroyed um, the, the 72 case as, as precedent because the court did in Windsor what it refused to do, at least in part, in the 1972 case. So precedent means a lot, but you do find yourself you know, in, in, in certain cases, in certain times, in uncharted waters, where you, where you have to, as we said earlier, um, ex extrapolate and you use what you can. Um, those are the toughest cases for judges because, um, uh, it, in, in using an example, years ago, of course, as was you know, noted, I had the, the, the uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover case involving the teaching of intelligent design and evolution. That, th there was marvelous precedent from the Supreme Court of the United States uh, that had to do with how we measure cases where the allegation uh, involves the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment, whether it is in fact an endorsement of religion. And there are tests handed down by the Supreme Court known as the Endorsement Test and the Lemon Test. Very crisp, very um, interesting, uh, very, uh, uh, usable tests for trial judges to use when, when there's an allegation that, that, that a, a, an enactment by a, a public body uh, is alleged to have violated the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment. Uh, I found those easy to use in the context of that case uh, and very helpful, and I directly uh, employed that precedent. 
Many people disagree with that precedent, by the way, as it, as it attends separation of church and state. But, but the Supreme Court hasn't done anything with those, those tests. And unless and until they do, they'll continue to be used and continue to be the tools that judges use to decide those establishment clause cases. So even in controversial cases like that, you can find helpful precedent that will allow you to, to, to more easily facilitate a, 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 a decision. You, how could, if I could just one second here, how, how could you avoid though the just the human side of this? In other words, you, as you laid out in your opinion, the stories of these people who just wanted to love one another, mm -hmm. and you identified the hardships they face. You know, having they just want to be parents, and they have to go through this convoluted second parent adoption procedure. Another person just wanted to visit her loved one in the hospital, and because she wasn't officially married, she'd have these issues. So you had this you know, screaming human side of how their lives have been displaced or marginalized. And then you had, on the other hand, the Commonwealth, which couldn't come up with anything other than a amoral. Wouldn't, wouldn't that have to precede or influence your take on the precedents? Because that's the human practical it does. side. It does. Because, you, you know, I'm, I'm applying. Um, I, 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 I'm finding facts, and I'm applying the law. Uh, and um, the, 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 the factual section of the Whitewood opinion was written very deliberately right now, sure. uh, because the stories were compelling, and they were poignant, and, and they were moving. And yes, they did help to drive that decision. And I'm not here to tell you in any way uh, that they didn't, because I, I'm not a robot, you know, and I'm, I'm not a machine. Um, you know, and uh, you know, the, the facts were very good, and the facts were very pro-plaintiff, and, and to the extent that the facts drove the decision, I wanted to highlight that um, in, the, in the opinion. So, um, you know, as you know, I mean, cases uh, are decided according to precedent, but they also stand on the facts right. uh, of, a, of a particular case. Uh, and you contrast, and you, you teed this up by your question, you, can, you contrast those, con, those compelling facts uh, of these people who loved each other and, and could not marry, couldn't, couldn't uh, you know, uh, to cite one of the examples, one of the uh, spouses, and I think you, you alluded to this, uh, was, was uh, on the death certificate uh, of, of her mate, uh, was not listed as a spouse, but was listed as correspondent. Uh, on the death certificate in, in one of the most devastating things that could happen to her uh, as she watched her, her partner die uh, and was listed as a correspondent. I wanted to, to show that alongside the, the utter dearth of, of um, rationale uh, cited by the Commonwealth. There wasn't any other than uh, the legislature did this, it's morally right, it's ingrained in our tradition and therefore it should stand. That was about it. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, it, it, certainly they drove uh, a substantial part of the opinion. You, you just underlined the, um, what I would call the emotional resonance of your factual findings. Is that a, a, a fair statement? And that kind of calls to mind that you divided the section uh, where you describe the plaintiffs into subsections based on the wording of the typical um, marriage vow. In other words, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. richer or poor sickness. Now, I have two questions about that. Can, can you tell us why you did that? Why did you engage in what could be described as a rhetorical uh, uh, technique? And, and secondly, if the emotional resonance of these factual findings are uh, so salient, doesn't that mean a judge with different emotions would have decided the case differently and that the rule of law is really something of a myth, that it's really the rule of law combined with emotion? I'm tempted to say I wrote it that way because I learned great creative writing at Dickinson College <laughs> and at the Dickinson School of Law. Um, there, I said it. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, a couple things about that because, Ben, that's a real good question. I, I, I have, I, I, I've been asked that question before, and you know, and another question you didn't ask, but I'll, you know, I'll indict myself is why did you end the opinion with, uh, uh, "We're better people than these laws represent." I uh, would suggest the two are linked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you, you might be right, and and um, 
and then it's time to discard the laws in the ash heap of history. They're editorial comments. Um, and there are those, and, and I fully understand this, who would say, you, you know, you shouldn't editorialize in an opinion, uh, just the facts, just the law. Uh, and um, I'm cognizant in a case like Whitewood um, that I'm writing for a broader audience than just the, the parties and certainly just the lawyers. Uh, and that the opinion is going to be consumed by the, the, uh, the uh, public. Um, I'm also cognizant that some judicial opinions have all the allure, reading them, of staring at a wall and watching paint dry. Uh, and, and, I, and that doesn't mean that I should glitz up an opinion and, and do violence to the law uh, or misstate the facts uh, by way of, of, of uh, supporting a decision. But um, in the case of the facts, um, you know, there was a little trick to the way it was written in the sense that we, we used the marriage vows as a hook. Some thought that was too cute by half. I was trying to make a point, uh, obviously, about the compelling facts, as I, as I just uh, uh, mentioned in the answer to uh, Dean Gilden. Um, if, if, if some people think it is, it is too cute, I plead you know, I'll, I'll plead guilty and, you know, we move on. And the editorial comment at the end of the opinion, um, that didn't drive the opinion, the editorial comment. That wasn't what I set out to do. Um, but um, I thought it was an appropriate capstone, uh, having read all of the deposition testimony and, and all of what I thought were uh, compelling facts and law in favor of the uh, of the decision. So was it written, um, did I take some creative license in writing the opinion? Yes. Um, is it quotable? Yes. Uh, uh, was it more understandable because of that? I think probably. Um, and so I'll, I'll stand by it. And that's the way I write opinions. Uh, others may differ. Uh, listen, nobody is a, a better creative writer than the aforementioned Justice Scalia. Uh, <laughs> if you want to read something that's entertaining, you know, read, uh, read uh, Justice Scalia's work. So um, I don't think it's a vice uh, necessarily to, uh, to, to uh, uh, take a little bit of license when you write an opinion. So I know judicial independence is an issue near and dear to your heart, and it's an interesting contrast because if uh, my facts are correct in 2010, three Iowa Supreme Court justices lost their seats in a retention election, which means you they couldn't get 50% of the people to, to vote for them to be retained, mm -hmm. uh, clearly because they had struck down this ban on same-sex marriage in Iowa. That was in an, an elected system. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, and, and again, maybe you're, it's not appropriate for you to answer this for other reasons, but do you feel more emboldened to act in certain ways because you're, you're not accountable to the electorate uh, because you have lifetime tenure subject to the rare air of impeachment, although I know people have threatened that generally over the past 10 years. Do you have a view as to whether judges do their jobs best if they're not subject to the elective process before, during, or after their? I, I, I've never really, that, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, an excellent point and a, a, of inquiry. Um, I don't know that I've ever thought about it uh, that much. I, um, you, you know, I think that uh, the, the obviously uh, because I'm a, you know, life appointed Article Three judge, uh, I would tell you that I think the framers got it right. And if we're to effectively uh, provide the bulwark that I said against the tyranny of the, of the majority and and um, adhere to the rule of law and make dis determinations unfettered. Uh, by fear of losing our seats, um, because we have decisional independence, uh, then, then um, you know, life appointment works, and to that extent, you're not looking over your shoulder when you decide cases. Um, some would disagree vehemently with that, I know, but it is the system, and it is constitutional, and it's the way the third branch at the federal level was developed. I'd have to ask my brethren and my sisters on the state courts, um, um, what the contrast is, I've never served in that capacity. And I think unless I did both, I'm, you know, it's hard to say, do I view the world differently in this job? All I've ever known 
since I put my robe on 12 and a half years ago is, is life appointment. Um, so I do my job, but, but happily, you know, blessedly, um, you know, there, there's been no uh, attempt to, I don't think, impeach a federal judge since the failed attempt at Justice Chase. Uh, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna lose my job for a decision that I, uh, that I made, no matter how unpopular it may be at any given time. Um, before I think you mentioned that, sometimes courts are not ready to tackle, is that tackle a particular mm -hmm. issue? Mm -hmm which suggests to me that a court can legit legitimately delay addressing an issue. And I find that kind of curious because mm -hmm. wouldn't that be a political calculation? Well, and that, if, it, if it is a political calculation, isn't the court sacrificing the rights of some sort of minority until the right political time comes along? Well, that's a, it, it's a Supreme Court issue, um, and you're exactly right. Uh, and, it, and there is a political calculation there, but not in the not in the Republican Democrat sense, uh, uh, but to say that the Supreme Court of the United States is blind to the realities of the time, uh, I think would be wrong. And Justice Ginsburg has talked about this uh, extensively uh, very recently and been very candid about it. And she has said that it was her view uh, that, uh, for example, the court waded into the abortion debate too quickly. She wasn't on the court, obviously, then. But, but in effect that Roe versus Wade was decided before its time and, and that the better way would have been to let it percolate through the states first, that the court was too eager uh, to wade into that controversy. And I think, uh, you know, on, on same-sex marriage, uh, she would counsel uh, that it's better to let this thing percolate as the court has uh, through the states before taking a case um, uh, unless it's out of necessity, there's a, there's a, a circuit split. Um, the, the court is aware, you know, it doesn't have, as it oft has been said, the, the, the sword or the purse. What it has is, is its integrity. And, and whatever uh, uh, imprimatur is caused by its integrity and, and the prestige of being the Supreme Court of the United States. And it doesn't want to squander that. And so um, while the court may get out in front of the parade um, and, and public opinion, I, I, I think the wiser courts have been careful not to get too far uh, out uh, of, uh, in front of, of uh, public opinion at any given time. So is there a political calculation in that based on sort of the tenor of the times? Probably. I think, I think that there is, and I think that uh, in, in candor, that, and I think Justice Ginsburg has been very candid about it, they would concede that point. Well, if it's the case that the Supreme Court is exercising sound political judgment in waiting for the right time, uh, how, and, and that it is a, something of a political judgment, why can't, shouldn't we use the same calculus in criticizing the district and circuit courts of appeal that have uh, recognized and have been at the, at the head of the parade? How, do we have different well, types of judicial decision making well, at different levels of the judiciary? Well, it, it, well, except that, except that I can't duck a case. They can. That's true. You know, remember their docket is discretionary. Mine's not. When 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 Whitewood initially filed Whitewood versus Corbett, then Whitewood versus Wolf, because the governor was substitute. When that appeared on my docket, I, I couldn't say grandly, "Well, listen, folks, uh, mm -hmm. I really don't think." we should decide this case right now. We ought to put this off for a year or two. Let's see where the wind blows and I have to decide it. You know, I'm the court of first resort in a case like that. And, and so would be the court of appeals had the governor chosen to, to appeal it, which he did not, my decision. Um, the Supreme Court's different, as you know, and as the dean knows. And, and so they have the great luxury of, of, of being able to wait these out a little bit. And I think that's precisely what they're trying to do in the same-sex marriage uh, context, deciding it only out of ultimate uh, uh, necessity. You can see that even with the circuit split, they're, they're, they're holding their cards pretty close to their vest uh, on this. And, and um, in justifying our, in, um, um, I'll use just, justifying uh, the, uh, um, actions by the district courts and circuit courts of appeal. Uh, 
the, you have relied a couple of times on Scalia's dissent. Mm -hmm. do, do you think it could be troublesome for a district court judge to rely on a dissent to understand the meaning and scope of no, the majority's no. opinion? And I'm not, kind of I'm not relying on the dissent at all, and, and, and I, I don't want you to misunderstand what I said. I'm relying on the majority opinion. What Scalia did is he called out the majority because they refused to say in the, in the majority, for example, that, that, it, that it was an equal protection analysis. Uh, Justice Kennedy never used the words equal protection. Scalia said in his dissent, essentially, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. You just did an equal protection analysis and you, you know what you did. And you have opened the door, Kennedy, uh, Tony Kennedy, to, um, to all these cases. So no, I don't, I'm not, I'm simply saying that Scalia called it right when he called out the majority for, for making a decision that, that would uh, open up. No, I'm relying upon, and other courts precedentially are relying on Kennedy's majority opinion. I'm just saying that, that, that Scalia uh, uh, essentially called it for what it was, and Scalia predicted the way I think the trial judges would view uh, the majority opinion. So it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I'm not relying on anything other than just citing what uh, that, that Scalia said other than citing uh, that he called out the majority. So Judge, having made the mistake of agreeing to appear on a panel with two academics who told you what we think should be in the judicial mind in your decision making, <laughs> uh, I'm curious as to what uh, has both surprised you and challenged you most about the job of judging after a career outside the uh, judging profession. Uh, what has surprised me, uh, and I had some students ask me this today, um, believe it or not, um, and I, tell, I say this often in, in, in terms of that question, these controversial cases, uh, at the end of the day, you, you decide them and you, and you move on. And um, I'm very comfortable with the decision that I made in Whitewood. I'm, I'm comfortable in any controversial case I've ever had on the, on the civil side. The hardest thing I do day after day, and I think my brethren on the uh, uh, county court who are kind enough to be here today would, would say this too, is to put people in prison, sometimes for very long periods of time, to look somebody in the eye and deprive them uh, of their liberty for extended periods of time. That is hard. It does not get any easier after 12 and a half years. Um, we, take that, we take everything we do seriously. We take that very seriously. Um, it is the most wrenching and, and, and difficult part uh, of the job and the job that you're most likely to internalize if you're not careful. Uh, one of the great attributes, I think, of trial lawyers, and I know you were one um, and have been one still, uh, and, and, and judges is to have a short memory. Um, but that's hard uh, sometimes. And uh, uh, if you want to talk about poignant, um, some of those cases are, are, are very, very tough and, and stay with you longer than others. Well, I want to thank the audience for uh, your patience. I think it's now time to turn to the question and answers, uh, and I'll turn it over to my students. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you uh, before asking it. Judge Jones, thanks for coming tonight. It's always a pleasure to hear you, uh, hear your thoughts. I have, a, I have a theoretical, and you may not want to answer this, or you, you can handle this any way you want, uh, but I have a, a theoretical thought about uh, the Windsor case, which was really important to what it is you did and, and your decision and what you wrote. So Windsor, uh, so Kennedy wrote the opinion uh, let's just say Breyer writes the opinion. All the words are the same in, in the uh, dissent and the affirmative. Breyer writes the opinion. Kennedy goes the other way and signs, signs on with the other side. So now you got four to five against. And you don't have 12 judges ahead of you at the circuit level who have decided this case. It lands in your lap. It's still the same arguments. It's the same emotional. It's, everything is the same, the same words. But now it's five to four against. How, how, does, how does that, I mean, is that a no-brainer? Yeah, I gotta go against this. Or how, how does that affect 
how you think about this case. I think it would have been a much tougher call, Jim. I, I think, uh, and that was asked like a true, the, the true great political science uh, professor that you are. <laughs> but but I, 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 uh, I, I think it would have made it infinitely harder. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I don't mean to dodge, I don't know. Uh, I think Windsor, Windsor paved the way. I said that uh, you know, several times tonight. I've never really reflected on what would have happened in that, uh, in that circumstance. But you know, I, 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 th I think you know, whether, whether Judge Jones did it or whether another uh, federal judge did it, uh, somebody was going to be the, the, the bell cow here uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular decision. I think they would have had a heavier lift uh, without Windsor, if it would have been four or five, as you say, and gone the other way, um, the, the road was easier, you know, the way it was. I, I just don't know. That would have been, you know, just a follow up. That's much more important than the 12 stories. Than the what? Twelve. I mean, you said you're the thirteenth. Uh, that the Windsor decision is well, much yeah. more important I mean, than the twelve. Yeah, you know. <laughs> A wag might say, you know, there's safety in numbers, and I just happen to be lucky 13. But you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I you know, we, we did look at the other opinions. Um, they're not precedential, as as we say, you know, in the business, right. it's some logic can be persuasive. But I wasn't in the business of citing uh, the other cases. Uh, these guys asked me, um, um, my my learned uh, interlocutors here uh, asked me about the, the way that I wrote it, and that brings to mind. Uh, you know, I, I was the 13th. Somebody did an, uh, an article. I don't know if it was in Salon or one of the online magazines. It said, <laughs> it said uh, that uh, Jones joined a, 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 in effect, Jones joined a long line of federal judges who seemed to be engaged in a creative writing contest uh, <laughs> with each other, you know. So again, guilty, right? Thank you. Thank you. I just, this is more about just the federal court system in general, and we talk about equal protection. And I know you're not at the level to make these decisions, but you know, from my past history uh, it, with death penalty litigation, uh, it seems to me that people in the Fifth and the Eleventh Circuit could claim equal protection of laws. Why should you execute us when nobody in the Second and Third Circuit ever gets around to like ever approving a death penalty case. Doesn't that sound unusual and isn't that a bit of judicial activism? Yeah, yeah. well, and, and what Judge Ebert is, is highlighting um, is, is we have a, a very broken system of habeas uh, uh, corpus uh, law and um, this is a lot of inside baseball but to, to sort of simplify it a little bit, we have a history in this circuit that's the third circuit that's comprised of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Delaware and the Virgin Islands, the circuit in, in, in which my court sits, uh, of, of just uh, uh, litigating and relitigating uh, death penalty cases to the point where nobody gets executed. The case is just churn. Uh, and it's fundamental, in my view, and I've said this in opinions I've written, it, it, you know, we have a death penalty. Uh, reasonable people differ greatly uh, about the efficacy and the, and the vitality and indeed the legality of a death penalty, but, it, but we have it, but we don't execute people. And it is, it is wrenching for um, uh, the families of the victims, but it's also wrenching for the, for the defendants and for their uh, families as well. They get marched out to death row, stays happen, they get taken off death row, stays back, back, back. It's, 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 it's almost perverse uh, how long it goes on. And, and so we have a circuit disparity uh, in the way that we handle uh, death penalty uh, uh, cases. It is a great issue uh, you know, for our time. And uh, it stems from the fact that uh, people who have been um, convicted of crimes in the United States have uh, the ability to file, fed even if it's in state courts, have the ability to file federal claims, habeas corpus claims, under uh, saying that their federal constitutional rights were violated in some way in the trial process, uh, the prosecution, the, the uh, trial. And um, we, it, it, it literally didn't exist, as Judge Ebert knows, uh, 
in any form like today, 100 years ago. It, it, this is relatively new, uh, and there have been some legislative enactments that have been designed to streamline it, but it has blown completely out of proportion. And our dockets are clogged in the federal courts with these habeas corpus cases that were the product of state prosecutions. There are some notable ones that I've had um, that uh, have emanated uh, from, from Cumberland County. And, uh, where we are tonight, and um, it's it's a it's a very tough it's a very tough area of the law. I don't I don't know what the answer is. I you know it's frustrating for everybody involved in the process. I would say. From someone on Twitter, Travel Due West asks if you have an opinion regarding the recent Ferguson grand jury decision. It, you one of the great foolish exercises uh, for for. Um, the, the, the punditry, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm not a pundit, I'm a federal judge, is to, is to wade into something that I don't know enough about. And so I, you know, I, I, as a citizen, I'm watching what's happening like everybody else, but, but it would be absolutely idiotic for me to, with all due respect to the question, and I don't mean he's idiotic or she's idiotic, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know enough, and I don't know what went on in the grand jury room, so I, I just don't know. Thank you, again, Judge. Uh, so your Kitzmiller decision dealt with the uh, establishment clause. Um, I, the more the recent sort of Hobby Lobby decision dealt more with the free exercise clause, and I was wondering um, if you had an opinion on where free exercise jurisprudence would go from here, whether we could still really rely on Employment Division v. Smith, or whether Yoder was back into play along with uh, RIFRA, um, and where you saw that those cases developing? You know, I've never had a free exercise case. Um, and so I, I, I confess, I, I'm obviously familiar with Hobby Lobby. I, I, I don't know uh, the answer to your question. I'd have to read the jurisprudence on free exercise. They're, those cases are rare, believe it or not, uh, on our dockets. More often you see establishment clause cases. So I, 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 I wish that I had a prediction for you. I don't, I, I do, I would say, and you didn't ask this question, but that, you know, it, it, it Certainly, establishment clause, and you didn't ask about establishment clause jurisprudence, but um, you know, there's been some thought that that, that may evolve, uh, uh, and that the test that I cited may loosen. Um, that much I know, and I got steeped in that in the Kitzmiller case, obviously. But no, I don't know where it progresses, if it progresses anywhere from from Hobby Lobby, uh, because frankly, I, I I didn't get taken to school yet in a in a uh, free exercise case, and I, I, so I have, to, I have to stand down on that one. On the establishment issue, though, I can't uh, resist taking this opportunity to ask you a question. It's always been lurking in the back of my mind about the Kitzmiller case, because I know in that case, the record of the school board and everything, it was, it was a pretty sad <laughs> record of what these people were doing. Um, but your ruling was more broad. It swept aside all intelligent design laws. And it occurred to me at the time, I, you know, I guess I'm a Star Trek uh, fan, and I was wondering, well, why, why couldn't you have an advanced species uh, and say, I believe human life started from uh, some sort of experiment by an advanced species from, well, Pluto. And uh, that wouldn't be religious, would it? Well, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> but, but that wasn't what I had, uh, you know, so. Uh, but you know, they that, teach intelligent design on the underlying theory that some advanced species from outer space, and they, they could teach but, the same stuff. But that wasn't what they did. No, that's, in that uh, case, and, and, no. And, and, and you know, it, it, every case, again, to, to Dean Gilden's point, stands on its own facts. Uh, these people um, turn their school board meetings into religious revival yeah. meetings. They, they, uh, they, they uh, basically uh, uh, introduced a, a, uh, uh, a concept that they knew nothing about, but they knew that it, uh, it wasn't evolution. They did not believe in evolution. Um, they, were, they were creationists, avowed uh, uh, creationists, and they wanted to get evolution. Uh, if they couldn't get it out of the curriculum, they grudgingly understood it was in the state standards, but they wanted to teach something at least alongside of it and take the edge off. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, evolution and and uh, under questioning, direct questioning, when they were asked who the intelligent designer was, 
either out of candor or abject stupidity, they said they thought it was God. Now, that really hurts your case uh, if, you, if you're yeah. trying to uh, uh, try a, an establishment clause case and say that your policy is not religiously based. Um, if it was a time traveling, you know, alien, that works better for you, but that's not what they said. <laughs> I was just wondering about the breadth of your, your uh, ruling there, Judge. Well, the, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I wrote it expansively be, because um, uh, at the end of the day, you know, in terms of intelligent design, the emperor had no clothes. It was a conclusion searching for uh, proof or, or justification and ap applying uh, the methodology that we use every day in federal courts to measure science, um, you know, is it, is it generally accepted? Is it testable? Is it peer reviewed? It, it failed. It failed utterly. It, 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 it crashed and burned. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a rout. And I, you know, you talk about writing for a broader audience. Um, they were, at that point, some of the intelligent design proponents trying to, to wedge that into school boards at other places in the United States. And what I, what I wanted to do with that opinion, and it, and, it, and it was used this way and I was appreciative, uh, was to let somebody else on a state board of education or a school board read that decision. And ultimately, they may not agree with it, but at least everything was there in 139 pages that they could understand what I saw. And you know, you know, in, in, in the almost 10 years now since that case was decided, no one has tried to do that in any other school uh, in the United States. And I think in part, it's be, be, because people have that compendium uh, that has been durable, I think, for that period of time and, and would lead, a, I think, a responsible school board away from making a policy decision like that, to, that and involving intelligent design. We have time for one more question. Okay, that concludes right, this evening's program. Please join thank me in thanking Judge Jones. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Did you have fun? I hope it was fun. Oh, it's terrific. Good. Should I sign up? Oh, there we go. No, no.